Hatchet by Gary Paulson, Chapter 8. At first he thought it was a growl, in the still darkness of the shelter in the middle of the night. His eyes came open and he was awake, and he thought there was a growl. But it was the wind, a medium wind in the pines that had made some sound that brought him up, brought him awake. He sat up and was hit with the smell. It terrified him. The smell was one of rot, some musty rot that made him think only of graves with cobwebs and dust and old death. His nostrils widened and he opened his eyes wider, but he could see nothing. It was too dark, too, too hard dark, with clouds covering even the small light from the stars, and he could not see. But the smell was alive, alive and full and in the shelter. He thought of the bear, thought of Bigfoot and every monster he had ever seen in every fright movie he had ever watched, and his heart hammered in his throat. Then he heard the slithering, a brushing sound, a slithering brushing sound near his feet, and he kicked out as hard as he could, kicked out and threw the hatchet at the sound, a noise coming from his, from his throat. But the hatchet missed, sailed into the wall where it hit the rocks with a shower of sparks, and his leg was instantly torn with pain, as if a hundred needles had been driven into it. Ugh! Now he screamed with a pain and fear and skittered on his backside up into the corner of the shelter, breathing through his mouth, straining to see, to hear. The slithering moved again, he thought toward, the, toward him at first, and terror took him, stopping his breath. He felt he could see a low dark form, a bulk in the darkness, a shadow that lived, but now it moved away, slithering and scraping. It moved away and he saw, or thought he saw it, go out of the door, of, uh, out of the door opening. He lay on his side for a moment, then pulled a rasping breath in and held it, listening for the attacker to return. When it was apparent that the shadow wasn't coming back, he felt the calf of his leg where the pain was centered and spreading to fill the whole leg. His fingers ginger gingerly touched a group of needles that had been driven through his pants and into the fleshy part of his calf. They were stiff and very sharp on the ends that struck out, and he knew then what the attacker had been. A porcupine had stumbled into his shelter, and when he had kicked it, the thing had slapped him with its tail of quills. He touched each quill carefully. The pain made it seem as if dozens of them had been slammed into his leg, but there were only eight, painting the cloth against his skin. He leaned back against the wall for a minute. He couldn't leave the men. They had to come out, but just touching them made the pain more intense. So fast, he thought. So fast thing cha things change. When he'd gone to sleep, he had satisfaction, and in just a moment, it was all different. He grasped one of the, one of the quills, held his breath, and jerked sent pain signals to his brain in tight waves, but he grabbed another, pulled it, and then another quill. When he had pulled four of them, he stopped for a moment. The pain had gone from being a pointed injury pain to spreading in a hot smear up his leg, and it made him catch his breath. Some of the quills were driven in deeper than others, and they tore when they came out. He breathed deeply twice, let half of the breath out, and went back to work. Jerk, pause, jerk, and three more times before he lay back in the darkness, done. The pain filled his leg now, and with it came new waves of self-pity. Sitting alone in the dark, his leg aching, some mosquitoes finding him again, he started crying. It was all too much, just too much, and he couldn't take it, not the way it was. I can't take it this way, alone with no fire and in the dark, and next time it might be something worse, maybe a bear, and it wouldn't be just quills in the leg, it would be worse. I can't do this, he thought again and again, I can't. Brian pulled himself up until he was sitting up t upright back in the corner of the cave. He put his head down on his arms, across his knees, with stiffness taking his left leg, and cried until he was cried out. He did not know how long it took, but later he looked back on, his, on this time of crying in the corner of the dark cave and thought of it as when he learned the most important rule of survival, which was that feeling sorry for yourself didn't work. It, w it wasn't just that it was wrong to do or that it was considered incorrect. It was more than that. It didn't work. When he sat alone in the darkness and cried and was done, was all done with it, nothing had changed. His legs still hurt. It was still dark. He was still alone and the self-pity had accomplished nothing. At last he slept, ag he slept again, but already his patterns were changing and the sleep was light, a resting doze more than a deep sleep with small sounds awakening, awakening him twice in the rest of the night. In the last dose period before daylight, before he awakened, finally with the morning light and the clouds of new mosquitoes, he dreamed. This time, it was not of his mother, not of the secret, but of his father at first, and then of his friend Terry. In the initial segment of the dream, his father was standing at the side of a living room, looking at him, and it was clear from his expression that he was trying to tell Brian something. 
His lips moved, but there was no sound, not a whisper. He waved his hands at Brian, made gestures in front of his face as if he were scratching something, and he worked to make a word with his mouth, but at first, Brian could not see it. Then the lips made a mmm shape, but no sound came. Mmm, nah. Brian could not hear it, could not understand it, and he wanted to so badly. It was so important to understand his father, to know what he was saying. He was trying to help, trying so hard, and when Brian couldn't understand, he looked cross, the way he did when Brian asked more than once. And he faded. Brian's father faded into a fog place Brian could not see, and the dream was almost over, or seemed to be, when Terry came. He was not gesturing to Brian, but was sitting in the park at a bench looking at a barbecue pit, and for a time, nothing happened. And then he got up and poured some charcoal from a bag into the cooker and start, then some starter fluid and he took a flick type of lighter and lit the fluid. When it was burning and the charcoal was at last getting hot, he turned, noticing Brian for the first time in the dream. He turned and smiled and pointed to the fire as if to say, see, a fire. But it meant nothing to Brian, except that he had wished he had a fire. He saw a grocery sack on the table next to Terry. Brian thought it must contain hot dogs and chips and mustard, and he could think only of the food. But Terry shook his head and pointed again to the fire. And twice more, he pointed to the fire, made Brian see the flames, and Brian felt his frustration and anger rise, and he thought, all right, all right, I see the fire, but so what? I don't have a fire. I know about fire. I know I need a fire. I know that. His eyes opened and there was light in the cave, a gray dim light of morning. He wiped his mouth and tried to move his leg, which had stiffened like wood. There was thirst and hunger and he ate some raspberries from the jacket. They had spoiled a bit, but seemed softer and mushier, but still had a rich sweetness. He crushed the berries against the roof of his mouth with his tongue and drank the sweet juices as it rained down his throat. A flash of metal caught his eye and he saw his hatchet in the sand where he had thrown it at the porcupine in the dark. He scooched up wincing a bit when he bit his stiff leg and crawled to where the hatchet lay. He picked it up and examined it and saw a chip in the top of the head. The nick wasn't large, but the hatchet was important to him, was his only tool, and he should not have thrown it. He should keep it in his hand and make a tool of some kind to help push an animal away. Make a staff, he thought, or a lance and save the hatchet. Something came then, a thought as he held the hatchet. Something about the dream and his father and Terry, but he couldn't pin it down. Aw, oh, he scrambled out and stood in the morning sun and scratched his back muscles and his sore legs. The hatchet was still in his hand, and as he stretched and raised it over his head, it caught the first rays of the morning sun. The first faint light hit the silver of the hatchet, and it flashed a brilliant gold in the light, like fire. This is it, he thought, what they were, going, what they were trying to tell me. Fire, the hatchet was the key to it all. When he threw the hatchet at the porcupine in the cave and missed and hit the stone wall, it had showered sparks, a golden shower of sparks in the dark, as golden with fire as the sun was now. The hatchet was the answer. That's what his father and Terry had been trying to tell him. Somehow he could get fire from the hatchet. The sparks would make fire. Brian went back into the shelter and studied the wall. It was some form of chalky granite or sandstone, but embedded in it were large pieces of a darker stone, a harder and darker stone. It only took him a moment to find where the hatchet had struck. The steel had nicked into the edge of one of the darker stone pieces. Brian turned the head back backward so he would strike with the flat near with the flat rear of the hatchet and hit the back black rock gently. Too gently and nothing happened. He struck harder and he struck harder, a glancing blow, and two or three weak sparks skipped off the rock and died immediately. He swung harder, held the hatchet so it would hit a longer sliding blow, and the black rock exploded in fire. Sparks flew so heavy that several of them skittered and jumped on the sand beneath the rock, and he smiled and struck again and again. There could be fire here, he thought. I will have a fire here, he thought, and struck again. I will have fire from the hatchet.